Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back, and uh, thank you very much. We're here for our last panel, which is a very important panel. Uh, we are going to now look at policy recommendations to boost cooperation in the South China Sea. Um, for, for anybody who's new, either here or online, I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the Sumitra Chair for Southeast Asian Studies here at CSIS, and it's an honor to, uh, to chair this um, eminent panel. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, they will each take uh, about 10 minutes. Um, each of them is going to focus on uh, somewhat different areas of, uh, of recommendations. There may be some overlap. It wouldn't be a South China Sea conference without some overlapping. Uh... <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyway, let me start by introducing my colleague here at CSIS, uh, Bonnie Glazer. She is the senior advisor for Asia in the Freeman Chair in China Studies, where she works on issues related to Chinese foreign and security policy. Um, Bonnie is, um, uh, has just returned from the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, she spends about half her time out in the hustings in Asia, uh, talking with uh, colleagues uh, from, from all the different Asian countries about these issues. So I'm really looking forward to Bonnie's perspective. Next, we have uh, Leo Bernard, or Leonardo Bernard. He's a research fellow with the Center for International Law, or CIL, at the National University of Singapore, uh, and focuses on uh, law of the sea, especially the South China Sea, maritime boundaries disputes, as well as ASEAN um, international dispute resolution and public law. So he is, Leo is, uh, has an excellent um, background um, to share some uh, views here, and I suppose Leo, you were also at the uh, at Shangri La. Is that right? No, I wasn't. Actually. Uh, you actually, uh, you actually got to avoid that. That's, that's very well done. Uh, Christian Lemaire is our third panelist. He's working with the Defense and Military Analysis Program uh, at IIS. He's responsible for ensuring the quality of the institute's maritime analysis and information on maritime capabilities. Um, he's written extensively on these issues, and I think he, were you there too at, at Shangri-La? Yes, okay, so two of three were, were um, at the Shangri-La Dialogue. All three have come from recently from Singapore, so we have, they have that in common. Bonnie, let me uh, ask you to kick off and, uh, and lead our discussion. Thank you, Ernie, and thanks to the uh, Sumitra Chair for uh, organizing this, uh, this conference for the, the third annual. Um, and I attend many conferences on the South China Sea and Southeast Asia issues. This is really one of the, um, one of the best, and uh, it's been a terrific two days of discussions. So I will try to uh, add my perspective and a few policy recommendations on some of the issues that we have been talking about over the last couple of days. Uh, there was some discussion yesterday about the need for uh, ASEAN uh, unity and centrality, and so I want to start by uh, endorsing this. Uh, there was reference, of course, to the fact that there were some uh, fissures that emerged in ASEAN uh, last year that made it more difficult to manage uh, the South China Sea. Um, as uh, Carl Thayer noted yesterday, cooperation uh, within ASEAN is proceeding uh, more smoothly this year. Uh, there obviously has been some progress toward negotiations on a code of conduct, um, and uh, I understand that the Chinese have said that uh, sometime this month uh, they may uh, begin uh, negotiations. So I would start by saying uh, that a code of conduct um, that is robust uh, is, uh, is, is important, um, and it should not uh, take uh, many, many years uh, to negotiate as uh, the DOC did. Uh, I think that it is uh, probably correct that this simple undertaking of negotiations may tamp down tensions to some extent. The process is important. Nevertheless, it is the product uh, that is important as well. Um, and just as our Acting Assistant Secretary Zhou Yun said yesterday, uh, I think it's critically important that this code be legally binding and that it contains a dispute uh, settlement mechanism. Uh, it must be more effective. Uh, than the DOC. Um, I would also say that um, there is a need uh, to really define uh, uh, concepts like uh, the status quo. And again, uh, Zhou Yun talked yesterday about what is a U.S. position that I agree with, that there should be no unilateral change in the status quo. 
Uh, but sometimes I think it's not too clear as to what that means. Uh, when uh, the Philippines, which is currently now trying to reinforce an existing position that it has had, I think, since 1999 uh, on Second Thomas Shoal, um, China claims that that is now um, a provocation and a unilateral change in the status quo. I'm not taking a position on this either way. I'm just pointing out that it is unclear um, whether it is the Philippines in this case that is changing the status quo or China, depending on what um, on how you interpret that concept. And you could say the same thing about the Scarborough Shoal last year. I, mean, I would personally argue, again, just my opinion, um, and gosh, I'm not a lawyer and my head is still spinning from the last panel, uh, but it seems to me that uh, when the Philippines brought in um, a cutter to arrest the Chinese fishermen that were poaching in the Scarborough Shoal, um, it would seem to me that they had the, the intent to uh, investigate what the Chinese fishermen were doing and then had the intention to withdraw. They were not seeking to unilaterally change the status quo um, of that, uh, the, um, uh, the Scarborough Shoal. So I think that there's a, it would be helpful um, to define these terms. If we don't, um, I wonder whether having a new document as the code of conduct is indeed to going to solve the problems uh, that we're all uh, facing. I think it's also important, um, just to uh, add a, a last point on the ASEAN issue, that um, ASEAN should not allow China to isolate uh, members uh, that are pursuing policies that it doesn't favor. Um, I personally felt that it was uh, disappointing that ASEAN remained silent uh, about the Scarborough Shoal incident last year, uh, because that, in fact, uh, led to led China to make conclusions um, and has led to many more problems um, and indeed uh, uh, perhaps uh, has contributed to the way that China is handling uh, not only the uh, second Thomas Shoal but also uh, the situation in East China Sea with the Senkakus uh, Diaoyu. Um, I said yesterday in a question that I asked uh, uh, Zhou Yun uh, that I, I very much endorse the decision by the Philippines to submit these uh, maritime disputes for arbitration. Um, I also think that international law should be applied in any possible way uh, to manage uh, this issue. Um, I had recommended, I think, last year at this conf conference that countries take their disputes uh, to uh, international courts for, uh, for, for settlement. So I think this is a positive step. And as I said yesterday, um, only the U.S., uh, Japan, and Vietnam, as far as I uh, uh, have, uh, based on my research, have backed this move. Um, again, I think that other countries should offer their support. Uh, if, um, if other countries uh, back this effort, um, indeed, as noted by one of our speakers in the last uh, panel, this could motivate claimants uh, to resolve the dispute possibly before the judgment is made. And so I think if you have a lot of countries that step up and endorse not the outcome, not a final ruling, but just the decision by the Philippines to take this for arbitration, perhaps that could influence um, how China approaches uh, this, uh, this case. I think other claimants should consider filing uh, similar cases. Uh, perhaps Vietnam would be a good candidate, but it would likely first have to uh, revise its baselines. Uh, I think that China should uh, consider preempting a ruling on the court by defining its nine-dash line in accordance uh, with international law. And I think that, we, that all the countries in the region would face a very negative uh, uh, outcome if the ruling, uh, in, in whether it's on the nine-dash line or some of the other issues that are raised are handed down against China, um, and then China ignores the ruling, um, I think that that would have very negative consequences for the region as anxieties grow about whether a more powerful China uh, will act in accordance with international law. Uh, other panelists, I think, are going to talk about resource issues, so I think that I will skip over that, um, and I will just talk a little bit about the need for more uh, confidence-building measures and conflict uh, avoidance measures, and I think I probably made some of these points last year when I was on this panel, but good ideas are worth repeating. Um, <laughs> The DOC includes uh, confidence building measures, uh, notification of other parties in advance of uh, military exercises, for example, um, exchanging information. China continues to call for implementation of the DOC. 
um, and negotiation of the COC, of course, could take some time, although I hope it doesn't. So implementation of the DOC is really not a bad idea in the meantime. Um, and there really are some, some good uh, provisions. The DOC uh, includes potential cooperative activities, such as safety of navigation and communication at sea, and those haven't been adequately implemented either. Um, so I think that those uh, should be there. The, we should create opportunities uh, for those to be discussed between China and, and ASEAN. There are other areas of cooperation, such as uh, sea environment protection, which I think was raised by uh, Dr. Sung from Taiwan yesterday, scientific research at sea, search and rescue activities, and uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief um, activities. Uh, there's also been, I think, some reference today as well as last year to ways to promote operational safety uh, among navies. One of those uh, uh, is the um, West Pacific Naval Symposium Code for Unalerted Encounters at Sea, which is known as uh, CUES, that was established in uh, 2000 and includes specific safety measures and procedures to be followed when ships and aircraft come into contact. Compliance with that is now voluntary, um, but could be made um, compulsory. Um, another recommendation that I would put forward is the establishment of a South China Sea Coast Guard Forum that could promote cooperation on a multitude of maritime security and legal issues. Uh, such a uh, Coast Guard Forum could share information and uh, best uh, practices. Um, finally, uh, I would recommend the establishment of something like a South China Sea Information Sharing Center uh, that would provide a platform to improve um, awareness, knowledge, uh, and communication among parties, and could also serve as an accountability mechanism uh, if states are required uh, to document any incidents that take place, and those could then be uh, presented to the center. So these are models that in some ways have been applied elsewhere, um, other parts of the world, uh, but could be applied uh, to the uh, specific situation in the South China Sea. And I'll stop there. Bonnie, uh, thank you very much. I want, I want to thank you for nailing it at 10 minutes perfectly. Uh, obviously a seasoned conference uh, speaker. Uh, Leo, not to put any pressure on you, uh, but uh, you're next. Uh, hi, uh, good morning everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, CSIS, for having me here. Um, the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about the possibility of joint development, entering the joint development arrangement in the South China Sea. And uh, I know this has been alluded uh, yesterday and in the previous panel as well, Henry mentioned that you know, joint development is one of the options when we have a, uh, where we can have a temporary solution in the South China Sea. Um, I'm gonna start with just giving you a, a, a brief background of what is joint development and the, uh, the legal basis of joint development in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS before I'm, uh, and after that I will go to the three elements that I want to discuss from the joint development. The first is the setting aside the dispute to enter into joint development and then the elements of without prejudice to the final agreement and identifying area for joint development. Now, joint development arrangement is uh, a form of provisional arrangement that UNCLOS uh, actually laid down, sp specifically saying that if there's a dispute on maritime boundaries, uh, pending the final agreement of that uh, dispute, then all parties should enter to enter into, should give all efforts to enter into a provisional arrangement of a practical nature. And this is the legal basis of joint development if you want to see, uh, if you want to look for the legal basis on UNCLOS. And joint development has a lot of form, and I think uh, Bonnie also mentioned uh, earlier just, uh, just now that the, it, can, it can be a for, in the form of cooperation and uh, preservation of marine environment. It can be a cooperation of exploiting hydrocarbon resources in the disputed area or in the form of uh, fisheries management in the disputed area. 
Now I want to go to the first uh, thing that we need to think about if we want to consider joint development, which is setting aside the dispute. Um, it seems easy, uh, there's like to set aside a dispute and agree to joint development, but it's actually probably one of the hardest part because it takes a lot of political will to actually uh, to agree to do that. And the, the problem in the South China Sea context is the rhetoric within the each uh, claimant, sta uh, claimant state is, has made makes it difficult for the claimants to set aside the dispute. But when, when, you, when we have rhetoric such as undisputed sovereignty, we have uh, full sovereignty, and uh, there's no dispute, it's all ours, this makes it difficult for the state to actually uh, turn back and try to agree on a joint development, some kind of joint de development arrangement. Um, I, I, I suggest that each claimant actually, and you know, not, not only all claimants actually guilty for this, or by stroking the fire of nationalism in their domestic political environment in around such an issue. Uh, but rather, uh, I think they have to think of uh, coming out with a better rhetoric rather than undisputed sovereignty, undisputed claim. Maybe just say, look, we have sovereignty in this future. We recognize other states might have claims, but we have the uh, we have the strongest legal claim, and the others doesn't have any legal uh, strong legal claim on on the on the on the features. Now, if if you have that, if you start with that rhetoric, that actually recognizing the the claim, the possible claim of other claimants, without actually giving out your uh, sovereignty of the future as well, and that actually opens the door to possible, a lot of co uh, pos uh, possibility for cooperation in the disputed area. But it takes a lot of political will, right? And you have to educate your domestic uh, citizens about that entering or agreeing or recognizing the, that maybe another state has a claim over that territory, over your territory, doesn't mean that you're giving up sovereignty of that territory. I think that's very important, which leads to my second element of joint development, which is without prejudice. This is a very important element, and I think unless you're a lawyer, you don't really grasp, uh, uh, like the, the layman, the layperson don't really grasp the notion of without prejudice, which means that you're setting aside the dispute, but you still maintain your basic position. You're not giving up your sovereignty. You're not giving up your claim. Your basic position is maintained. What you do is you just setting aside the dispute. Look, we, I, have, so I have complete sovereignty, and you said you have complete sovereignty. Let's take that aside and agree to cooperation. Right? It's not that you're giving up your sovereignty. It's not that you're giving up your basic position. So this is something that all states in the South China Sea need to do before they agree to enter into any kind of joint development. And of course, when you agree to enter into joint development, then you have to have restraints. And this is also actually mentioned in Article 74 and 83 of UNCLOS, that you shouldn't do anything to jeopardize the reaching of the final agreement, which means you have to maintain the status quo, which means you're not allowed to have unilateral action that, may cha that might change the nature of the disputed area. So that's a, an, a, another important element in the, uh, before entering into a joint development. The last element that I want to discuss is how to define the area for joint development. We have a really good discussion yesterday about uh, how you need to clarify the claims before you even want to think about joint development. And as a lawyer, I totally agree with that. It is, it's, it's great if you can clarify the claims because if you have a clear area of dispute, it is easier to define or to identify areas that's uh, possible for joint development. However, I want to challenge actually the parties uh, to identify areas that possible for joint development anyway without clarifying the claims. It seems uh, impossible, but actually it's not. Because if you see the map, there are, we're not talking about joint development of the whole South China Sea. 
that just doesn't make sense, right? And you have to remember that joint development is actually a second option uh, compared uh, to the maritime uh, final maritime boundary agreement. So this is only a temporary solution, which I, in a lot of cases, I hope uh, it can be a permanent temporary solution, but uh, let's start with a temporary solution. So you have to remember, you want to narrow down the area as small as possible for joint development. And without clarifying the claims, I would argue that it is still possible to have a certain area for mo a model for joint development in South China Sea. Take the Scarborough Shoal, for example. I don't have a laser pointer, but the Scarborough Shoal is located uh, quite in the north side of the no north right of the map, and it's only claimed by China and the Philippines, right? And oh, thank you very much. Uh, I. Uh, I'm not a geographer, so I'm not really good. So Gra Greg <laughs> maybe can correct, but I think it's, it's around here somewhere, the Scarborough Shoal. Um, like Nong Hong and uh, Professor uh, uh, Da Castro yesterday actually mentioned that back in the days, the fishermen from China and Philippines actually fished there peacefully along each, uh, alongside each other. And uh, Dr. De Castro yesterday brought up like, why can't we go back to that uh, status quo? Indeed, why can't we go back to that status quo? We don't need to for China to clarify what is the nine dash line. We don't need to, for the Philippines to clarify what is their outer limit of their uh, two hundred nautical miles. Both agrees that they've been traditionally have fish in the Scarborough Shoal. Why can't you just set aside the dispute? Don't bother with what do you mean with the nine dash line? What do you mean with your claim? What do you mean with the KIG? Just set aside the dispute, sit down, and talk about some kind of a fisheries cooperation that you can enter into in the Scarborough Shoal. Right? It, it is possible to enter into this without, uh, without sacrificing your claim and without clarifying your claim at the same time. Uh, if you want to talk about uh, Vietnam, it's, it's a bit more tricky because of the dispute in Paracel is highly sensitive. China don't want to talk about it. Vietnam is very sensitive about it as well. Uh, but historically, uh, China and Philippines has managed to agree on maritime boundaries in the Gulf of Tonkin, which is a, a, good, a good sign that they can actually agree on uh, a very sensitive area of dispute. Like, I, would, I would recommend like maybe, because Paracel is somewhere over here, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it's areas over here uh, see this straddling between the boundaries of EZ between of uh, the the middle mid median line of possible EZ between uh, Vietnam and China over here, just above the Spratlys uh, Islands, but below the Paracel. So this may be a possible area where Vietnam and China can do some can explore the possibility of uh, hydrocarbon uh, exploration uh, possibilities over there. It's it's less um, controversial in a sense. And it doesn't involve Philippines, so it's just bilateral between China and Vietnam. If you want to be more controversial, I guess you can look at uh, the Spratlys over here, and like the, some of the larger islands of the Spratly that might generate EEZ, I think it's located somewhere over here in the northern part of the Spratly. If you want to have a, a, a multilateral joint development, maybe you can agree on areas somewhere over here, just north of the Spratlys between, well, Maybe let's say uh, the the three main claimants China, Philippines, and uh, Vietnam. Then you can agree on the area of to join develop uh, this area, see the hydrocarbon possibilities, or maybe uh, turn it into a marine preservation area. It's it's possible, right? So we can't we can't really be stuck in. You have to clarify the claim. You have to clarify the uh, the area of dispute, because. You know, as much as I want to have that clarified, it's because it will make life easier for sure. But again, it doesn't guarantee that it will settle the dispute. We were, we heard yesterday it might actually sharpen the dispute. And going from our colleagues from China, it's very unlikely that China will clarify what does uh, what the nine dash line means. So we can't be hung up on clarifying the claims. But sometimes we just have to agree to set aside the dispute, identify a specific area where we can agree that you have claim, I have claim, my claim might be stronger than yours, but let's set it aside and agree on joint development. And I think uh, that's still a possibility, whatever the result of the arbitration tribunal is. And with that note, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Christian?
Uh, thank you, Annie. And um, I'd just like to preface my comments by saying uh, that I'm delighted to be here at the invitation of the CSIS, and I'm particularly happy to be uh, involved on this, the most gender-balanced of all panels of the conference so far. Um, now, there's a, there's a danger of being the last speaker that anything of import and interest has already been said, and I think that's certainly the case with the previous speakers we've had over the last day and a half. So um, I could just stop here. But I'm going to continue and hopefully fool you all collectively into thinking I'm saying something of interest to you. Um, I'm going to focus on particular and very practical policy recommendations uh, within the South China Sea that are specific to the regional states, uh, and therefore the US is largely excluded from this, although it could act as an advisor and even a, a, an ancillary uh, involvement uh, in these various recommendations. Um, and I would place the various policy areas um, that these recommendations sit under into four separate categories, which we could rather pithily call the four Cs, uh, and appropriately call the four Cs. Um, the first of which, and it's been discussed significantly over the last day or so, is clarification. Um, I would say that clarification of claims does not lie entirely with just China as well. The various other disputants should also look towards clarifying their claims. Um, for instance, when Vietnam claims the entirety of the Spratly Islands, does it include James Shoal in that, uh, which China clearly does? Uh, and also clarification, as has already been discussed, of the maritime features uh, in the South China Sea. What are they, uh, what do they connote, and what are their maritime entitlements? Um, the second policy area uh, would be collaboration, and this follows on quite closely um, from the first. Uh, one could imagine, in the clarification of the maritime features and their, their entitlements, a form of collaborative uh, series of working groups between the various disputants. This would also help in segregating out the various disputes, because uh, there's not just one dispute in the South China Sea. There are really four, maybe more. Um, so, for instance, you could have the disputants to the Paracel Islands, China, Vietnam, Taiwan, involved in the working group in trying to outline exactly what features there are in the Paracels uh, and what they're entitled to. Similarly, all six disputants to the Spratly Islands, but only three disputants to the uh, Scarborough Shoal. Uh, obviously, you run up across the very difficult uh, issue of what to do with Taiwan, uh, and that points to the fact that many of these recommendations are very realizable. Some of them may be very unfeasible, but they could also act as ideals to which you could uh, gradually try and pursue uh, some policies to uh, work towards. Now, Leo is just talking um, extensively about joint development, which is very laudable. Um, I wonder whether there might also be some utility in looking at joint prohibition as a collaborative um, policy area as well. Uh, the unilateral Chinese fishing ban, for instance, uh, if we were to turn that into a multilateral fishing ban uh, with the proviso that it's to, uh, to keep safe for future generations fishing stocks and make sure they're not entirely depleted, that would undermine and undercut the, uh, the concept that this is a Chinese policy uh, in its own sovereign waters and is more an actual regional collaborative policy instead. Um, I would definitely recommend um, Bonnie's point on the South China Sea Coast Guard Forum, which could uh, mirror the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum that already exists and involves Coast Guards from uh, often very contentious or rival nations such as Russia, China, the US. Um, uh, and following on from that, uh, if we are looking at areas of joint prohibition or joint development, could we in the future conceive of uh, joint or coordinated patrols in these areas by either law enforcement agencies or even military agencies. China already has coordinated patrols on the Mekong River um, that it's uh, been pursuing for the last two years, I think. Um, could it look towards a similar development in the South China Sea? Uh, military operations other than war by the militaries themselves are also very useful. Um, and Bonnie pointed out search and rescue and HADR. Uh, search and rescue has been a key area for the Arctic Council and was, in fact, the first legally binding Arctic Council resolution. Uh, two years ago. HEDR will be the focus of ASEAN exercises involving China this year as well. So there's obviously areas that um, the various militaries can coordinate there to slowly build confidence. Uh, avoiding incidents at sea is also a, a very collaborative measure one could pursue. Um, now, this wouldn't necessarily involve mirroring the INCSI agreement from 72 between the US and Soviet Union, uh, but it could incorporate elements of it. And I think one of the key aspects of the 72 INCSI was that it involves an annual meeting between the US and Soviet Union to discuss various incidents at sea, uh, which we have to some extent between China and the US in MMCA, but we could think of on a, on a regional basis in the South China Sea. The third policy area um, I would call contextualization, and the theory behind that is to try and move the um, narrative of the South China Sea away from the developing narrative of a Sino-US bilateral military competition, um, what was so eloquently 
uh, stated yesterday as elephants either fighting or making love in the South China Sea, and more towards one of a, a regional dispute uh, involving ASEAN as a key actor in uh, furthering or limiting tensions within the region as well uh, and incorporating China. Uh, and this would try and move the narrative away from one of, of conflict and, and one towards collaboration. Uh, and the fourth of the four Cs uh, I would call civilianization. Um, this isn't just in terms of demilitarization of the disputes, but uh, also in terms of prioritizing the role of ministries of foreign affairs rather than ministries of national defense or even the militaries themselves in the discussions and rhetoric around these particular disputes. If we were to, for instance, institute an annual MFA meeting of the various disputants, um, that would suggest to uh, all the disputants and the wider international community that it is the civilian foreign ministries that are taking the lead on these policies rather than being driven by the often more bellicose and zero-sum uh, thinking of the militaries themselves. Um, the DSC has been mentioned several times, and an aspect of that is uh, a freeze on new occupations, but could we in the COC work towards perhaps a freeze on uh, continued construction on current occupations or any further development of fortifications that already exist, with a final goal being to demilitarize or civilianize the, um, the islands themselves? Now, we have a... Um, we have a, an example there in 2000 when Taiwan uh, removed its military and replaced it with the Coast Guard administration uh, to move all the militaries towards Coast Guard administrations in, in the South China Sea could be a, an excellent example of demilitarization and a step towards uh, complete demilitarization in the future. Now, these four areas are obviously just confidence-building measures, uh, and all they do is manage tensions in the South China Sea in the short to medium term. They don't work towards any kind of final resolution. Uh, I try and avoid using the phrase final solution. They don't work towards any kind of comprehensive resolution in the end. To do so, I think we need to look at um, treaty and law. Uh, and I would highlight two particular historical examples of treaties that might have some bearing on where we go with the South China Sea. Uh, the first of which is the Svalbard Treaty, um, which was drawn up in the early 1920s um, by a variety of nations to deal with the what was then called the Spitsbergen Archipelago, but is now the Svalbard Archipelago. Um, and the treaty essentially stated that uh, Norway would have complete and uh, indisputable sovereignty over the archipelago, but that all nations that were signatories to the treaty would have the right to economic exploitation uh, within the islands themselves uh, and also within the territorial waters. Uh, and there would be a variety of uh, collaborative measures such as an international meteorological station. Uh, it would also be entirely demilitarized. Norway would not allow any fortifications on the islands themselves. The second would be the Antarctic Treaty and the various, uh, organi uh, various agreements that have occurred since the Antarctic Treaty was drawn up in the 1950s. And this is very much the opposite end of the spectrum from the Svalbard Treaty. So rather than looking for indisputable sovereignty and joint development, the Antarctic Treaty uh, looks towards no sovereignty and no development. Uh, so it does not recognize any sovereign disputes uh, or any sovereign claims within the Antarctic and does not allow any future claims to be made. Um, it also does not allow any explo economic exploitation of the Antarctic, but does encourage uh, international scientific uh, research to be undertaken in there. Uh, it demilitarizes the Arctic, although it allows for temporary uh, deployments of militaries in support of those international scientific research missions. Um, so I'm not suggesting that either of these treaties are the perfect examples for the South China Sea, and there's a lot of uh, issues with the South China Sea that don't pertain to either Svalbard or the Antarctic, but they do set a spectrum of where we can look towards historical treaty as an example of either uh, indisputable sovereignty and joint development, or no sovereignty and no development, and whether one of those two models might be uh, suitable for the South China Sea in the longer term. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panel. Let's open the floor to, uh, to questions. Uh, again, just please identify yourself and your institution uh, when you get started. Uh, right here. Thank you, Chair. And actually, it's a carry-on question for the last panel, but I think it's still very relevant to this panel because we have lawyer, have policy, and security experts here. So the question is still relevant to the Philippine arbitration case. Could so you identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, Hong Nong from the China National Institute for South China Sea Studies. So my question is that, well, up among the five arbitrators in this course, apart from Judge Wolf from Yanmai, uh, Ju Judge Rudiger Wolf from which is nominated by the Philippine government, the other four arbitrators were appointed by the 
president of Italo since Judge and I, but as in his uh, Japanese nationality. I was very partial because as a student of international law, I always believe just and fair and international litigation arbitration. But I was very partial and disappointed to see the release because the president uh, appointed by Judge Yan I of this arbitration court, arbitration tribunal, happened to be a Sri Lanka arbitrator who has a very strong Filipino background because he's married with a Philippine wife. And a few days ago on May 31, he was quit as the post of uh, president of this uh, arbitration court. So I was wondering, because although China decided in, uh, due to its commitment to its 2006 declaration, it decides to not be a part of this process. But you will watch very carefully how this process will go on. So with this specification uh, situation, how do you evaluate whether we're seeing a fair and just process in this whole uh, arbitration course? I would like to hear your comment from the lower perspective and security and policy perspective on this. Thank you. Okay, Leo, that sounds like it's yours. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take a bite. Um, the the appointment of the four arbitrators it's it's a bit tricky because of the non participation of China actually put the president of ITLOS in in a corner because the the rules of Annex Seven is if the parties couldn't agree on if the, if the the another party failed to appoint arbitrators on behalf of themselves and then couldn't agree on the rest of the three arbitrators then the president of ITLOS has to appoint the rest of the panel. But the president is limited to appoint people that is on the list of arbitrators, of the UN list arbitrators under Annex 7. So it, if you see the list, not all state parties of UNCLOS has nominate uh, people there. Only a few states has nominate people. So you have, you have a list of people being nominated by state parties, and not all of them actually have strong legal background as international arbitrators. If most of them are very, very capable in a very specific area, or like maritime security or environment, but not, not a lot of them actually a very qualified public international arbitrator, which is what they need for this case. So if, if, you, if you narrow it down, to that requirement, then you have a very, very limited choice for the president, right? I know it seems like there's no, there's not enough Asian rep a representative in the panel, but if you see the other Asian names in the panel, those who have names in you know, renowned reputation of public international law in the world is limited to either uh, Japanese, which again, I can obviously China will furiously object if uh, the Japanese judge appointed Japanese. And another one that just appointed before, uh, as the case has been brought uh, by the Philippines was Judge Pike from the from Korea. But it's it's a bit difficult as well uh, to appoint a Korean judge. Probably I can't speak on behalf of Judge Yanai, but I can see why China would object if a Korean judge is appointed to the panel. So it, it, I, I, I don't know for sure why uh, he's like this for uh, uh, arbitrators the way he did, but I can understand his uh, difficulties in selecting uh, the people to be appointed on the panel. And I, it's, it's a bit European heavy, yes, but I think he did the best what, with what he has. In a sense, there's, there's uh, there's present from uh, strong EU countries like Judge Wolfram and uh, I think Judge Court from the, uh, from France as well. But then there's uh, the judge uh, from Polish judge uh, uh, who's he's appointed on behalf of China, which is not uh, a big EU, not not a big, uh, not not a not a top not a, the top five Security Council country. You know, like I think I think he tried to balance it out the best he can uh, in appointing uh, between like big big countries, uh, small countries, and, and Asia countries. It's, it's a difficult choice for him, but you know, it's, it's the best he can do, I guess. <laughs> I just want to add something very briefly. Um, I have nowhere near the knowledge that Leo has on this subject, um, but I think his answer suggests that uh, China has problems with 
many of its neighbors. So it makes it really <laughs> difficult to choose uh, a judge that China's going to see objectively. But I guess I'd also challenge your point that just because somebody's spouse is from the Philippines, that well, that maybe I misinterpreted your question, but you did cite that as a, re as, as a reason. Um, I, I, I guess I would just at least challenge that portion uh, of your question. Um, I think that a, 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 uh, an individual um, can uh, carry out the mandate, uh, uh, take on the responsibility, uh, and offer a fair judgment um, irrespective of where their spouse happens to be from. Christian. Yeah, just briefly to echo that, um, I would say I'm a big fan of English cricket. Um, I'm also aware that the history of the British Empire may have created some slight resentments uh, in a lot of different countries around the world. Um, just so, slightly. just a few, as I see in Singaporean. But um, so I'm aware that when I watch international cricket and England playing cricket, some of the umpires may have uh, issues with uh, with England generally. Um, but I allow them to make decisions that I often don't agree with because I uh, have implicit trust within the system and I accept their jurisdiction as very experienced and independent um, uh, arbiters of this particular game. Now, I think this has some reflection on what's happening with the arbitral tribunal in that um, Leo pointed out there are very difficult decisions to be made with um, the, uh, those involved in the tribunal um, and obviously care has been given to who has been involved uh, and I think we have to have some trust in those that are being asked to be representatives here, uh, that they won't be swayed by the fact that, for instance, they have a Filipino wife or um, they may have some issues with historical uh, you know, policy, policies from China. Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Sun Jin from Chinese Embassy, but I will speak totally on my personal capacity as an international law lawyer. So all the good things and bad things are going to myself. <laughs> I think I, I listen very carefully on all the observations previous session and also this session. I have two comments and one question. The first comment is about the source and nature of international law when this conference want to draw attention to. When we talk about the international law, we only seem to emphasize on the law of the sea, UNCLOS. We do not touch upon that international law not only includes treaty law, also includes customer international, which means in 1947, there's still international law. Also, at that time, there's no UNCLOS. So when we emphasize on international law, we should not only emphasize on UNCLOS. UNCLOS is only one aspect of international law. In particular, when we try to resolve the problems in South China Sea, we should put much more attention on the historical of the development of international law. Because in 1947, China has already had a map there. China has already has 9-9 And then Chinese government also sent their naval fleets to each and every islands and features of the South China Sea to lame them, to mark them. That's the historical facts. That's also relating to the international law. So when we mentioned, I think some speaker in the last session, the international cannot be divorced from the power. I could not uh, comment on that, but I will say international law could not be divorced from the history, the history facts. This is one comment. The second comment is also relating to the international law, because I'm a lawyer here. Concerning the nature of international law, when we said international law, international law based on the consent of states, which means the state would also would only be obligated to those rules which he consent. Relating to the international law rules concerning the anglos, it is clearly China has made declarations in 2006 that he will not subject the South China Sea disputes to the dispute resolution mechanisms of the UNCLOS. So that's the willingness of the state party to a convention. You may argue that when you join the convention, you have agreed to all the provisions on the convention. But in this situation, we have the declaration. And I think 
the major state to this convention could say that this provision is a self-interpretation one, such as like I think in the future, maybe some countries will join the convention and also said some military activities is totally belong to the interpretation of the country it itself. So this situation of self-interpretation is a common practice in international law. That's not the only thing that China wants to do. So China will not agree to arbitration, not because he not respect international law, because he does not subject to these provisions to international according to his international intention and consent. This is my second comment. I have uh, the last point to make is that I don't agree that uh, whether you agree to arbitration or going to ICJ is the solely criteria for the country to say that you respect and promote international law or not. Because I think my friend from uh, the government here is also, he will say that when they join the UNCLOS is, is not a criteria for the respect of the international laws either. Because the state is not a party to the UNCLOS. What's important here is you try to resolve all the disputes and problems in the South China Sea by a way which is suitable for all the concerning, relating, claiming parties here. That's the way I think forcing one party go into arbitration is not quite a way, especially this country is firmly objection to that. So that's what I would like to say. So I thank you when you join your recommendations, in particular from the international law, lawyer friend of mine, to also put emphasis on this. Thank you very much. Okay, let me ask the panel if they have any reaction. Uh, just, uh, okay, just very quick. Uh, I, do, I do agree that uh, the dispute in the South China Sea is not only about UNCLOS, right? There is uh, other matter of international law that is involved in the dispute. And I agree not a lot not a lot of like focus has been given to that other aspect of the dispute, which is the sovereignty dispute, which is not a matter of UNCLOS. And I think it's it's a good idea. Maybe next year uh, CSIS can focus on the, the conference on the sovereignty dispute. That would be interesting and probably <laughs> that that's probably like that's the first in, in my mind because like you're right, most of the uh, conferences focus on the maritime aspect of it. Um, I just want to, uh, uh, just a minor correction on China's declaration. China's declaration is not that China agreed not to bring the dispute on the South China Sea, but it's specific on 298 that they, they don't agree to bring any dispute in relation to maritime boundary delimita delimitation as laid out in Article 15, 74, and 83. And then, of course, also military activities and marine scientific research. Uh, is, or matters relating to military activities and marine scientific research is excluded for the dispute settlement. Uh, whether or not the questions brought by the Philippines can be considered as an extension to uh, a matter of boundary delimitation is a whole different argument. And I think that's up to the tribunal to decide whether they can carve out the questions uh, uh, from maritime delimitation boundary issues and found jurisdiction or not. So I just want to highlight that two points. Christian. Uh, just very briefly um, on this issue of the primacy of UNCLOS. I mean, if China doesn't want UNCLOS to be the primary legal instrument that is utilized in the South China Sea, it shouldn't sign a declaration on conduct that specifically states UNCLOS as the primary legal instrument through which these disputes will be resolved. Um, and on, um, on 1947 maps being customary international law, I'm not sure one could really claim the nine dash line to be customary international law. Um, so customary international law is, is very useful and, and has its role, but I'm not sure that has much relevance to the nine dash line specifically. Uh, gentleman here. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Uh, Yang Hui Song from Taiwan's Academia Seneca. This panel is about policy recommendations, and I would like to comment on uh, Ms. Glaser's policy policy recommendations, and you mentioned a number of forums, Coast Guard Forum, for example, but I would like to bring your attention to a number of existing forums. For example, the head of Coast Guard administration in the Asia Pacific, 
its existing forum and its track one level. And there are other ASEAN maritime forum or expanded ASEAN maritime forum. There are also maritime legal experts forum or meeting held in Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. So a number of them plus APEC, Ocean and Fisheries Working Group. So we can base upon those track one and because track two sometimes you need to go to the track one dialogue process. And the second one is about, the, that's my personal opinion, not, not on this cre creative thinking, nobody talking about this, but in this, and inspired by our discussion here, the 11 dash line, as gentlemen say, 1947, on the Republic of China, and then the two, the two lines were deleted, right, in 1953, and then the fisheries agreement signed between Vietnam and China, again, confirmed the de deletion of two lines. Now let's talk about the line 11. Anyone know the line 11? That's between Taiwan and Philippine side, the Bashi, ba Batan Island, Bashi, Bashi Channel or Strait. Now, and it comes to the question of Pratas Island. Can Pratas Island generate 200 miles ecology economic zone? I would say yes, and there's no dispute. Now, if that's the case, is that possible to have a fisheries agreement between Taiwan and the Philippines and considering the possibility of clarify that line? And following that precedent, then we have other, and then we take the step-by-step -step approach to clarify different lines in the South China Sea. That's the approach I'm thinking. I'm on my personal opinion. I, I, I have no, but anyway, last one. I think it's very important for us to think about to putting aside the disputes uh, and working on joint development or ecotourism and joint pres preservation and conservation of the marine environment in the South China Sea. The Philippine government has proposed the ecotourism or peace park in the South China Sea in Spratly. Now China is doing the uh, seesaw tourism, right? Tourism in, in the San Sao Sisada. And Taiwan also considering that the, to bring the build a um, marine peace park. Can we have used the concept of Antarctica and common heritage of mankind and try to have a bigger vision that the, the, the South China Sea can be shared by all the users, including freedom navigation, in freedom conservation, fish, whatever. Is that easier? And then when you go to court, arbitration, you, you turn ugly. And there are so many different evidence, historical evidence, and you don't have control of those lawyers. And what are they thinking about? And what are they going to do? So that's the risk. So my, that's my... Make money. <laughs> 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 not, not for your personal purpose, but for the national interest. Make money is important. But anyway, thank you very much for, for your thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Twee. And then we're back there. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Thuy from uh, Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, three panelists, for very useful recommendations. I appreciate very much um, a lot of recommendations, for example, um, join fishing in Paracel, join um, fishing ban in uh, South China Sea, join patrol, for example. But from our discussion yesterday and today, we see just um, the main obstacle for any kind of cooperation and joint development also is clarification of claims. And a lot of um, uh, speakers recommend China to clarify the claims. But my concern is just not clarifying the claims, but clarifying according to international law. If you are cl clarify the claims not based on international law and use this claim as a basic for joint development, is is not uh, suitable for other claimants also. And second issue is how to convince China to accept uh, your recommendation of uh, joint um, fishing in Paracel, for example. And um, specific issue for uh, Ms. Boni, um, as, as I remember Hillary Clinton declared yesterday, U.S. will facilitate the cooperative uh, process in the South China Sea um, my question is, uh, is that um, 
can you give uh, more recommendation for US how to facilitate the cooperative process according to our recommendations here? Thank you. Okay, let's go to the panel. Would anyone like to comment? Bonnie, you, you've got a specific question there. Yeah. Uh, Leo um, is going to start. Um, how to persuade China to for joint development? Um, by letting them not clarifying the claim. <laughs> uh, like like I said, if, if it's it's very difficult to see in the near future that China will clarify what the nine dash line means. I don't see that happening anytime soon, to be honest. And uh, of course, if if they do clarify their claims, we do want them to clarify their claims on the basis of international law, right? But it's just the issue of uh, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, call me pessimistic, but I don't say it's happening. Uh, but we 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 can't let them. We can't let that stop joint development. If if you do feel that there are a certain uh, aspect or a certain area in the South China Sea that you feel that you can persuade China to enter into joint development, then you shouldn't wait for China to clarify their claims. Like like I said, I you know the the Scarborough Shoal is a good example of where a possibility that you can have joint development in the area without having either party clarifying the claims. And maybe there are some areas in the between the Philippines and China where both parties can agree to have joint development, uh, any form of joint development, without having uh, China clarifying the Nandash line or without having Philippines, uh, uh, sorry, uh, without having Vietnam uh, revising its own baseline as well. Right, so we, we want to avoid this technicalities, difficult uh, issues between the two claimant states and just agree on uh, what can you do together to move forward in a certain area that you agree. I, I just want to, um, I'm going to ask Bonnie to answer Twee's question, but I, I've talked with the CEO of Forum Energy after he came back from discussions with Sinuk, uh, the CEO of the Chinese uh, oil company, and they actually, he said, we could joint develop uh, oil and, and natural gas resources easily on a business case, no problem. But we have no, we, there's no foundation of international law that we can base our agreement on. So that's where we're stuck. You know, we, we could do this deal tomorrow, uh, but they couldn't, they didn't have a place to, um, to, to build the, the uh, no, They can have the basis uh, on the agreement with Vietnam and China. Okay, I'll, bilateral I'll agreement. To, that will be, that will be enough, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll have to put you in touch with them. Bonnie, did you want to respond to tweet? I, I think there are several things that the United States is doing. Uh, we can go back to uh, Peter Dutton's uh, presentation. Certainly, just uh, trying to rule out any use of military force to discourage, dissuade, uh, and deter other. Uh, countries or any country from using uh, military force, I think is you know one set of things that we're doing. Uh, statements such as uh, uh, Acting Assistant Secretary Joe Yun made yesterday, um, the August, um, I think it was the August 4th, uh, 2012 statement that was made by the State Department, um, which also mentioned, I think, uh, use of international law, including arbitration. Of course, we've had subsequent statements in support of that. Um, but then if you go to the level of actions, what can we really do? Um, and, and that really, I think, is, is, is where the challenges are. And as you know, in the case of the Scarborough Shoal, the United States did quietly facili facilitate, which, by the way, it's not cooperative. It's a collaborative process that Secretary Clinton said. And so what I think we tried to do was facilitate um, diffusing tensions um, and a, a return to the status quo ante, which was discussed um, earlier. Um, and we had uh, one uh, side, uh, one party that essentially, the, well, well, first I would say there was, as I understand it, an agreement. Maybe it was not written, uh, but there was an understanding that both sides would, in a face-saving way, withdraw uh, from uh, the shoal. Um, and of course, the Philippines subsequently did, uh, and China did not. And in that kind of a case, um, very, very difficult. The United States can't stand up and say, but wait a minute, there was an agreement. Um, we, you know, we tried to play a quiet, positive role uh, to facilitate a, a positive outcome. Uh, but um, I would guess that there are some lessons learned on all sides for, from that experience. Um, I think all countries will be very wary 
of having those kinds of negotiations or discussions with China in the future without signing something and having the international community know what was agreed upon. Uh, the gentleman in the back of the room uh, with his hand up there. And then we're here with Mike and Tang. Uh, good morning. I'm Mr. Lloyd from the University of Maryland. My question is just very simple. Um, first, it's about um, geographical, historical, and number two is about economic. Uh, when you say that you have the claim over the islands way back to as far as the first and second century, that was the time before Christ. Why didn't you occupy the islands continuously and permanently since then? And what is your reaction to the claim of the Spanish government when they arrived in the Philippines in the time of Magellan, that they have the map um, claiming the islands in behalf of Spain and, of course, for the Philippines. Why didn't you protest as early as the 15th century? And now that you are an economic power, why do you have the nerve to steer the waters in South China Sea and bullying the smaller neighbors, Philippines, Vietnam, and all the other claimants, that you are now an economic power? Why didn't you steer the waters when the Russians are still in Cameron Bay in Vietnam, and the Americans are still in Subic Bay in the Philippines. Why only now? You should have stirred the waters way back then in the first cent century or in the 50s and the 60s. Why now? Please give us a very comprehensive answer. Thank you. OK, I, thank you. Um, anyone want to respond to that? Yes. Um, Thanks for the impassioned question. Um, I mean, I think uh, you know, there's lots to unpack there, but one thing we could talk about is uh, the cultural aspects here. I mean, is it fair to criticize um, an East Asian state that has gone through a variety of different imperial and uh, other forms of government over the last 2,000 years for not adhering to current and modern Europeanized concepts of international law? Um, you know, why does Vietnam not occupy the, the Paracels back in the 19th century when it sent a variety of different flotillas out there and would regularly try and harvest uh, a variety of different resources from the islands. I mean, it's just not something that the states thought they had to do, really. Um, if you think you have a claim to it and, and you try and li later resurrect that claim, um, it's a bit difficult to criticize very ancient dynasties and governments for, for not adhering to modern international law. Great. Very good. Um, Mike, and then uh, Dr. Chang. Mike McDevitt from uh, CNA. A question for uh, any of you at the panelists. Uh, when we talk about clarification of claims and what have you, it's always been, or the past two days, it's been about China. Uh, it strikes me as I'd like your opinion about, one, the feasibility, and two, uh, the long-term implications. If, for example, uh, Vietnam and the Philippines engaged in a negotiation to uh, rectify their uh, overlapping claims in the Spratleys. Would that, uh, were they to reach some understanding of, uh, uh, on that basis, would that help move the ball forward when you deal with China? Oh, I'd just comment briefly, Mike. I do think that there is a, uh, uh, there have been some suggestions along the lines of what you're saying, that if China is unwilling to try and solve these claims, then the other parties that have claims uh, that are in dispute should try to separately negotiate their claims uh, and uh, delimit the boundaries um, with, and land features and maritime boundaries, make whatever progress can be made, set some examples, and then hope that China will later join that process. To so, my knowledge, I think nothing has actually transpired in that regard, has it? Or has it not? Well, well you could take, for example, um, I understand that just, I'll just give you a brief example. I think that Brunei and Malaysia signed a boundary agreement in 2009. Um, and then the following year, uh, they agreed to jointly develop uh, two blocks. Uh, they signed this 40-year production sharing agreement and started drilling in September 2011. So that would be one example. We have a two-finger here. Uh, can I have the microphone here uh, at this table? I can answer to just question. Um, you know, ASEAN claimant now the 
implicitly uh, reach a common understanding of um, status quo. Uh, techno activity just can affect other country interests. And if you see my presentation yesterday, all of the incidents happened between China on one side and on the other side, Asia, Vietnam, Philippines, or Malaysia. We did not see any incidents between ASEAN claimants. And in reality, Vietnam, for example, with Indonesia, we have a delimitation of continental shelf in 2003. We have joined uh, submission with uh, Malaysia on the on outer limit of continental shelf in 2009. We have a lot of cooperative mechanism with Philippines. So w within ASEAN claimants, there's no problem, I think so. Good point. Uh, Dr. Tang, uh, back here, Phoebe. Uh, thank you, Tang, from the Vietnam uh, Lawyers Association. Uh, I have a, a questions by way of comments to uh, Leo and uh, Kristen, but uh, before, uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, share my view with the Chinese uh, participant uh, spoke a little bit earlier about the link between international law and history. And when, yeah, of course, when we talk about international law, we have to talk about history too. And and when you talk about the Nidash Light in 1947, I think you, you should also mention about the declaration by uh, the People's Republic of China on the territorial sea in 1948. In that declaration, China states very clearly that the sea between the islands in the South China Sea are high sea. So there's no historic rise, no historic waters in the South China then. Uh, now go back to uh, all the recommendations which are fa fantastic by uh, the panelists here. Uh, 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 for Leo, uh, I am a little bit bothered by your recommendation that we uh, conduct joint development without uh, clarifying the claim. Because uh, if we look at the practice of joint development around the world, then we see that most of the agreements are based on maritime entitlement, overlapping maritime entitlement and which are legitimate under the law of the sea. And if that leads to an assumption that whenever you have a joint development agreement, you must have some legitimate basis, legitimate basis or lawful basis for your claim. So how we can conduct joint development without clarifying the claim? And then I think it is, uh, it is very, very, um, uh, wise and smart to uh, <coughs> have a server spot of joint development in the South China Sea. But I think it is only one way to avoid the, the current situation where actually the whole South China Sea is disputed. So if you have a joint development in one part, a small part of the South China Sea, then it doesn't work out. How about the rest? And if you look at the, the, the situation in the East China Sea, then uh, you have a very small area for joint development in China and Japan. And in 2008, it hasn't, we have nothing uh, from then. Uh, and I don't think that the agreement worked really well in that case. And now to Kristen. Yeah, I, I, th th I think the idea of uh, joy prohibition is quite interesting. But it goes uh, contrary to the spirit of the law of the Sea Convention. Because the law of the Sea Convention talks about legal order for economic exploitation. So if you advise the, 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 the countries in the South China Sea to impose joint development, a uh, joint prohibition, then I think that it must go against their interests in advancing the claim in the South China Sea. Because what they want to have in the South China Sea by raising or by making all those claims are for the resources in the South China Sea. It's not for the small uh, minute feature in the South China Sea. It is the assumption that they have to have a, the sovereignty of the future to have the resource in the South China Sea. So I'm a little bit bothered by your, your, your <coughs> proposal that uh, we have a joint prohibition on all activities in the South China Sea. Thank you. Gentlemen, would you like to uh, respond, please? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, most joint development you, uh, is the basis of most of joint development practice in the world has a certain uh, legal claim that each state put forward. 
But we have to remember, if, if we look at provision of own clause on maritime delimitation, the first principle on maritime delimitation is actually agreement by states. UNCLOS actually doesn't say uh, clearly, uh, it doesn't say like uh, how do you do the limit, it doesn't dictate how you do the limitation. The first way is actually agreement by states. So that's the first principle. But if it fails, then there are certain guidance that UNCLOS and the uh, precedents of international court and tribunals provide on how you delimit uh, boundaries, right? But if we take the basic principle that uh, boundary delimitation is by agreement, then we can adopt that into a, a model of joint development that even though legally both parties may not have clarified their claims, but if they agree, if both agree, this is, this is very important, if both agrees that a specific area is disputed between the two parties and feasible for joint development, I don't see why both parties can't enter into a legal agreement to jointly develop that certain specific area. Of course, we're not talking about China and Vietnam agree to develop the Arctic or some part of the Pacific Ocean, right? Because we, we, we basically know like the areas you know, in dispute, we, we can assume what are the areas in dispute and it's just a matter of whether or not uh, Vietnam, in this case, agree to a certain specific area, then yes, that's in dispute. No, that's not, that's not in dispute. We can't join develop on that. So you, you have to find, uh, uh, you have to reach an agreement of which area that both of you agree that yes, this is a gray area that yes, we can develop. And if you can agree on that, then I, I, I think it's possible to have joint development. I don't see why. Um, on, on your question about uh, why do we bother joint developing only a small part when the dispute is actually the whole part, uh, like I said before, it's impossible for, for, you, for, for the countries to come into an agreement to jointly develop the whole of South China Sea. I, I don't think Vietnam won that. Because uh, it, you know there are certain parts that Vietnam probably only have dispute with China and don't want to necessarily share it with Malaysia or Philippines or Brunei, and you know it's the case, same case with the other claimants as well. So that's why I suggest a small uh, areas as a model, as a model. If it doesn't work, at least there's a, a confidence building exercise that uh, Bonnie actually referred to. The process of negotiating, coming up with the uh, model for joint development is a confidence building practice or exercise that can be useful in building the relationship between the claimants and building trust again between the claimants. If it failed, it failed, but it's, it's better that you tried to achieve something rather than it's not going to work, we can't. Uh, you know, you have to change the mentality of, and this is, uh, again, to all the claimants that you have to change the mentality that you can agree on something, that some there is some agreement that then you can uh, achieve and join develop a certain area together. Uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, Christian? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, I'm not sure joint prohibition is really qualitatively different from joint development in any way, to be honest. Um, uh, perhaps it's framed incorrectly or used the wrong phraseology and perhaps we should call it joint conservation of resources or, or what have you, but one could easily imagine a common fishery zone similar to the Gulf of Tonkin fishery zone that had certain quotas, had certain times of the year when you weren't allowed to fish. Uh, and we're just taking those elements of a joint development area and saying perhaps we should start with the joint conservation rather than joint development because it's slightly less controversial and undermines the issues about uh, the unilateral fishing ban that is currently being imposed and has been for the last 14 years by China. Good. I have the gentleman in the pink shirt, and then uh, Henry. CNA and also CSIS. Um, the, Bonnie, you, you sort of thought that maybe some of the other claimants could work something out, and then we just heard, you know, a sort of different point of view. It's the same that I heard in Shangri-La, depending who you s spoke to this past weekend. But my question is a follow-on, really, to you on this. Um, Brunei and Malaysia, they have a very different relationship with China anyway. Uh, and so one could say, because of that, it's, it's kind of easier. But would the United States, in your view, be uh, in a position to really reconcile 
the others who have more difficulties with China to maybe convince the Vietnamese that this is something to work out with the Philippines. Is this something, you know, you talked a little earlier about, you know, we, we say a lot, but we don't do a lot. Here's something we could really do, perhaps. What do you think? Or maybe what do the other panelists think? It's a very difficult question. I mean, ultimately, are you, uh, are you positing a role for the United States as mediating between uh, some of these parties? I think that in any kind of mediation, uh, the first question is whether or not the parties want mediation, and then whether they want that particular party, in this case being the United States, to be the mediator. Um, and then you have to ask the question as to whether that mediator, the United States, wants to take on that role. I think in I would doubt that the answer would be yes to any of those questions. I don't think the U.S. wants to mediate. I don't think that there are any of these uh, countries involved that would choose the U.S. to be the mediator, nor do they necessarily want mediation. So in cases where there is a potential solution, I would guess that it, the most likely outcome is that those two parties are going to get together and find their own solutions. So uh, for those reasons, I just think it's unlikely. If I could just add, I think the most useful thing the United States could do is really emphasize its and back up its policy statement that it wants to see a strong and integrated ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have taken steps in that direction, yep. but we have to do much more. And, the, and those should be recommendations that are included in this report. Did anyone else want to comment? Christian? Just uh, very briefly, I mean, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with both uh, what Bonnie and Ernie said. Um, but I've spoken to European diplomats who posited a mediation role for the EU. Um, and for similar reasons, I don't think it would be acceptable. It certainly wouldn't be acceptable to China. Uh, it may not be acceptable to other ASEAN states as well. Um, I think even those slightly less controversial, slightly less historically entangled states such as Norway or Switzerland, who may be perceived as being independent, would face similar barriers to any kind of involvement in the South China Sea. So you know, I think mediation, external mediation um, would be a wonderful thing, but I don't think it's acceptable to the parties. OK. Uh, Henry and then uh, Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for taking the floor again. With all due respect to Leo, I have to comment on the first, the concept of joint development. When you have the nine dash line, it makes a lot of sense. Do you have your own pointer? Yep, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so, would, would that, that's a violation, Henry. Because <laughs> I have to do this because sometimes it's very easy to talk theoretically when you don't adapt it to the, to the map. The technical is as important sometimes as the substance. What I'm trying to say is, would you allow joint development here or it's only on this part? So when you have 85% of practically all the EECs, it makes a lot of sense. We're not against joint development, but there are steps you have to do before you go into that. When you talk of Antarctica, are you going to apply to the whole? Are you therefore saying that it don't? With Indonesia, we try to have a joint development on the overlap. Indonesia does not. Indonesia is correct. Because the overlap of the EEZ does not mean that we, have, we can actively delimit. In this, in this case, therefore, before you talk of joint development, you have to take certain prior steps. Then you can identify which area. You don't go into this process. It's very hard. It creates more, more problem. My last point on your Scarborough. It's a very dangerous proposition. I'll tell you why because it will encourage the mindset, oh, in the end, I can have joint development if I am able to occupy. So what I will do is I will do this with a union. Then after a union, it's Sabina Shoal. After Sabina Shoal, Iroquois Reef. After Iroquois Reef, Douglas Reef. Why? Because I am in control. I can dictate. That's a dangerous mindset, actually. And that's is exactly is the mindset that will be encouraged with that proposition. My last point on confidence building. I have nothing against confidence building, but sometimes confidence building, the, the concept of confidence building is to create the environment, right? But sometimes it becomes the final solution, <laughs> right? And at the end of the day, it, it assumes a double-edged sword. It becomes a double-edged sword. I will amplify on the JMSU, for example. Sometimes, it, maybe the problem is not the lack of confidence. Maybe the problem is abuse of confidence. Maybe the problem is not lack of communication, but something more than that. Let me 
JMSU, for example, it's not true and it's not correct to say that because we never had the implementing guidelines, there were no CBMs. There were a lot. In fact, the JMSU was a confidence building measure. It was a marine scientific, exactly. But because of that JMSU, because it included areas like the Reed Bank, there were no objections before. We had a license to British Forum before 1997. But when JMSU was applied as a marine scientific research and as a joint confidence building measure, China objected to that. On what basis? The contractual provision. So therefore, if it's a matter of contract, we disregard now JMSU. After that, from a contractual provision, no, we have indisputable sovereignty. So in a sense, if you're not very careful also with this confidence building, they can be used as an affirmation that, that there exists a con con that, that that confidence building affirms the legitimacy of the existence of a dispute. That can also I'm not saying not all the time, but you have to be very careful about it as well. Does that mean that you cannot jo go into joint, uh, joint cooperation? No. Part 9, actually, of UNCLOS talks about cooperation in the semi-enclosed sea. And that's not a problem. In fact, you can go into this conservation. We are for it. That's a very good situation. But in the light of the 9-9, it makes it difficult. That, is, that has been our experience for the last 20 years. What is the lesson learned from our perspective? It is important, therefore, now that you have to clarify the 9 dash line. Then, on a step by step basis, you can go into joint cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. That for us was the lesson. Thank you. You want to respond? Um, yeah, thank you, Henry. Um, I, 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 I agree with you in part in the sense that. The ideal situation would be each party to clarify their claims before you can move on to either like joint development or any kind of cooperation agreement prior to a final delimitation agreement. Um, I'm not suggesting that you should joint develop uh, the whole of South China Sea. I think that's impossible, right? Um, the, the, the basis of why, why I would challenge the, the parties to actually try to come into a joint development arrangement without having uh, clarifying the claim is with condition that both parties have to agree on a specific area that they feel that, yes, this specific area can be a model for joint development. Now, I only took Scarborough Show as an example because of the exchange between uh, Hong Nong and uh, Dr. De Castro yesterday when they said, uh, fishermen from the Philippines has fished there traditionally in peace alongside each other for the longest time. So this practice shows that actually if, if you want to go back to that status quo, it, it can be a, a, a form of cooperation, a form of, a form of cooperation within the two parties, setting aside the dispute. And this is again another important uh, point that I, I respectfully disagree in the sense that uh, the UNCLOS also made it clear, just because you agree to a provisional arrangement doesn't mean that you recognize the legitimacy of the claim of the other party. And I think, uh, I, 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 I truly believe no court would actually use that against you if you joined, uh, agreed to join development agreement because the joint development agreements under UNCLOS 74 paragraph 3 and 83 paragraph 3 is without prejudice to the final agreement, which means anything you agreed on on that provisional arrangement or joint development cannot be used against you in reaching the final agreement. So um, I think that's something that you know each, each party want to think about. Is it possible? I know it's difficult. I know it's very sensitive. But if we wait, if you want to wait until China clarify their claim, it's going to be a very, very long wait. And uh, yeah, it's it's even even when uh, arbitration come with a decision, first uh, it's going to be difficult to have China comply. It's going to be a challenge. I'm I, I can't predict what's going to happen in how China will react, but it's going to be a challenge for Philippines. And second, it still doesn't settle the boundary issues, right? You still have to agree on. A boundary and pending to that final boundary agreement you know you have to look on joint development as well and at that time you have the decision from the tribunal but you still don't have the clarification from China so you're still stuck uh, so it, it's it's a difficult situation and I'm just trying to suggest a solution maybe out of the box but you know may, it might work it might not work but it's it's a possibility 
Okay. Thanks. Uh, Peter. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I actually want to respond to uh, Mr. Bernard and, and to, uh, I guess, sort of second something that Christian's been talking about, which is um, why not jointly develop the whole South China Sea? Um, I mean, essentially, um, the contention we've seen over the last couple of days um, suggests that we really ought to just shift the discussion entirely. Um, uh, I wrote about this in an article called Three Disputes and Three Objectives. But, but the bottom line is we haven't really considered here how international law is actually the problem. Right, because parties are pursuing international law, which is essentially a win-lose outcome. Right, um, you know, somebody wins, somebody loses, and what you end up with is structural instability. Right, because the loser is always unhappy with the outcome. Um, if we shifted entirely to a discussion about um, a, a regional answer, um, you know, not necessarily based directly on international law, but a regional answer. Uh, that shifts the discussion, it could be a better answer, um, especially when we're talking about a historical Asian system that was much more open than uh, opportunities that traditional international law today would, would offer. So uh, we could, in fact, there are ways to replicate a shared resource zone um, among this, the South China Sea coastal states. This is another answer, and it's a win-win answer, right, where you're not building in structural tension or structural instability. So I'd like to at least suggest, talk about out of the box. I mean, it is a possibility that hasn't been directly considered. And maybe, in fact, international law is the problem. Uh, yeah, I, that's, that's a really good argument, actually. Um, uh, <laughs> two points, though. Uh, I guess the first point, it depends on what kind of joint development that you're talking about. If you're talking about joint development of hydrocarbon resources, do you think Vietnam want to share their blocks with Philippines and Malaysia over here? If you're talking about the nine dash line that comes all the way here, and do you think Philippines want to share their oil resources with Malaysia and Brunei and Vietnam over here? That makes it difficult if we're talking about hydrocarbon resources. Or they can give them all to China. Or they can give it all to China if you think they, they, they would agree to it. That's fantastic. Or we can give it to the Knight of Malta, who, which has traditional claim to the Spratly Islands. That settles the issue as well. Um, Second point, uh, I think if we're talking uh, hydrocarbon resources, joint development hydrocarbon resources, very difficult. High, uh, joint development for marine preservation or fisheries agreement, more possible but still has its challenges. If, because if you're talking about uh, marine preservation and fisheries management of the whole South China Sea, you're talking more, more than just the six claimants here. We're talking about the nine dash line come a bit with the Natuna which is Indonesian waters or Indonesian EZ on continental shelf, which you have, means you have to involve Indonesia. You can't, you know, Brunei and Malaysia has been on the sideline so far, but we can't forget that they do have claims, uh, overlapping claims with the nine dash line when, 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 if we're talking about the maritime zones. Mm -hmm. And how do we handle Taiwan? We can't exclude Taiwan if we're talking about fisheries. Taiwan is a big, long distance fishing entity. Right? If I don't want to say country, uh, <laughs> but you know, but you know, you can't ignore Taiwan. Taiwan is a very, very important fishing entity. So, and I don't know how China will react to it. So that's the challenge. If you're talking about fisheries management in the South China Sea, you have that that challenges. That's why I'm all for joint development in the whole South China Sea. And one Article One Two Three actually, when we talk about semi and close sea, also uh, meant that the same uh, uh, cooperation. But I do recognize the challenges, and it's 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 small possibilities that all parties can agree to one model of joint development in any uh, area. So that's why I suggest like small areas. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're at that hour. We've had four C's, three D's, <laughs> baking, cricket, and baseball analogies. We've got pointers in the audience at this point. I think things are getting a little bit out of control. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for your incredible energy and um, and good thoughtful input. I want to ask you to join me in thanking this terrific panel for helping us with recommendations. The um, all of the papers that were delivered will, are up on the will be up on the CSIS South China Sea website. It's part of the CSIS website. And if you'd like to uh, comment or provide input to that, uh, please send us an email and we'll make sure your comments are heard. Thank you.